Should we make more James Webbs for other wavelengths? Why are there different types of stars? How do I feel about flat Earth claims? And are there any binary supermassive black holes? All this and more in this week's Question Show. It's time for the Question Show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Restoration Shaman, would it make sense to make more James Webb telescopes in different spectra? It depends on what you're trying to do. So James Webb was built with a very specific goal, which was to observe the earliest times in the universe. And so the universe has been expanding the light that has come from the early universe. Originally, these were galaxies very similar or, you know, primordial galaxies similar to what we have today with stars that were shining in bright blue and pumping out ultraviolet and, you know, with gas clouds and red stars and all of this. But then over the lifetime of the universe, as the universe has expanded, the wavelengths of that light has shifted from what was ultraviolet and visible light into near infrared and far infrared. And so James Webb is designed to see into those wavelengths and perceive those galaxies, they would be invisible. Like if you went if you know, if we showed you a picture of these early galaxies, invisible light, they would be invisible, you couldn't see them. But because James Webb can see in infrared, this is possible. Now, the problem is that the other telescopes at different wavelengths are getting old. So the Hubble Space Telescope has a 2.6 meter mirror, James Webb is 8.5, it is much bigger. And Hubble probably isn't going to last too far beyond the end of the 2020s. So we've really only got like maybe six to eight years left for the Hubble Space Telescope. And then there will not be a large visible light, ultraviolet light telescope in space. Now there's going to be some monster ground telescopes like the extremely large telescope, the Magellan telescope, like there's a bunch of big telescopes that are in the works on the ground, but there will be no space based telescopes. The plan for the next great space observatory is called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And it's going to be, in many ways, a twin of James Webb, it's going to have probably the same size mirror, so a 6.5 meter primary mirror, but it will be a visible light telescope. And its job is to try to observe the surfaces of exoplanets and try to allow astronomers to be able to measure the atmospheres of these exoplanets, Earth sized worlds orbiting around sun like stars. But once you move into other wavelengths, if you try to make something like like yes, you could make a, a web version of ultraviolet. But once you move into other wavelengths like x rays and gamma rays, you can't use telescope mirrors in the same way that you can't bounce x rays off of a curved mirror and then focus them in to an instrument to be able to make your image, they work differently, they're too high energy. And so a lot of the x ray telescopes and gamma ray telescopes are more like cones, where they collect a large area x rays come in, and they sort of hit the side of the collecting area. And then they're they ricochet down into the instruments that are trying to watch the sky. And so they work very differently. And so it just like, it wouldn't make sense to make a x ray or a gamma ray version of James Webb. And it wouldn't make sense to make a radio waves version of James Webb either. I mean, there are radio telescopes, and they work really well, just make them bigger. So, uh, so we could use more James Webb's, we could definitely use James Webb sized Hubble Space Telescopes, but those are sort of the only wavelengths that really make sense for a uh, space telescope to have that configuration. Shauna Ellis, when stars are born, do they know what kind of stars they'll be? For example, red giants? Well, the kind of star that you get is purely based on the amount of material that went into the star, it's the mass. And so there are a variety of masses of stars that we can get. On the smallest side, are the red dwarfs. And really, it's the the very beginning, the smallest possible star is what is the smallest amount of hydrogen and helium you can have in a ball, where there's enough temperature and pressure at the core of the star that heat that hydrogen fusion can begin that there's enough pressure to smirch and this is the technical term hydrogen into helium, and that releases a tremendous amount of energy and that sort of makes the star shine. And that amount is about 
7.5% the mass of the sun. And sort of the other way to look at it is about 80 times more massive than Jupiter. And Jupiter is like made of star stuff. So if you went and found 79 more Jupiters and mash them all together, then you would have enough material that you would have a star, the, the smallest possible star. And that's the red dwarf. Now you can have larger and larger red dwarfs and eventually you can move into other types of stars. And then when you end up with about the amount of material like the sun has right one solar mass, um, then you get a star like the sun. And really, you know, if you collect together the amount of material that makes the sun and you line them all up, they will be roughly the same kind of star. They will appear mostly identical. They'll be about the same temperature. They'll have about the same kind of atmospheric composition. They will put out about the same amount of radiation. But then you can add more material. You could mash those sun like stars together and they start to get hotter and they start to get bigger. And they, instead of shining in, say, white light or yellow light, they start to shine in blue light. And the most massive stars are monsters. These are stars that can have say 60 times up to 100 times the mass of the sun. And the problem is that when you have those stars that have a lot more mass than what our sun does, then they live very short lives, they go through the material in the core, they die within about a million years. And part of that process is that star changes from this blue supergiant into a red supergiant and it expands outward while say a blue supergiant is going to be definitely a lot bigger than the sun, you know, maybe 10 times bigger than the sun, a red supergiant, the kind of this, the final phase of one of these stars, it could be 2000 times bigger than the sun. And so really, you know, back to your original question, do stars kn like know what kind they're going to be? It just depends on the mass. If you have a little bit of mass, you get a red dwarf, if you have of sun's worth of mass, you get a star like the sun. And if you have many times the mass of the sun, then you get these ludicrous blue supergiants. If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron only podcast feed, and get the overtime segments as well as other special behind the scenes episodes, including our monthly patron only question show. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Angel Luis Figaro. Jordan Turner, Dan Thompson, New Zealand Astrophotography Competition, Ronald Schmidt, and David Sean. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Ronnie Coleman, I'm just going to be a little silly and ask your thoughts about flat Earth. I don't have any thoughts about flat Earth. The Earth is round. Uh, the scientific consensus is overwhelming. And, uh, and anybody who makes the claim that the Earth is flat, uh, you can safely ignore. Uh, they're either trolling you, or they're unwilling to put in the very base level of research to find out that the Earth is indeed round. Uh, we've known about this for 1000s of years. And the flights that we take every day around the planet confirm it the ability to see different constellations from the northern hemisphere than what we see from the southern hemisphere confirms it. So, uh, you know, I get tons of comments on my videos about people who are flat earthers, and I just ignore it. Uh, I don't need to have that conversation. I don't care, you know, if and I and I don't think you need you don't you shouldn't feel the need to defend the scientific consensus that we live on a round Earth instead, enjoy having conversations about space and astronomy with other people who are as passionate about this as you are so filled with wonder at the discoveries that are being made about the universe. And you don't have to feel the need to have arguments with trolls about these like fundamental issues that were cleared up 1000s of years ago, we've moved on to other things. Like what is the true nature of dark matter and dark energy? Um, you know, what happened in the earliest moments of the universe? What is the source of the highest energy radiation that is striking the Earth? Are we alone in the universe? Will we find other civilizations out there? What is in the interior of even planets here in the solar system like Neptune and Uranus? How many exoplanets are out there? What kind of exoplanets can we find out there across the universe? Uh, what are the processes that caused planetary systems to form? Like these are the kinds of questions that are interesting and fascinating and real that people don't know the answers to. So uh, no, don't pay it any ever. Don't pay it. No, never mind. Um, just have, you know, follow your curiosity about the universe. 
light dark. Is it actually possible to see the light from the Big Bang? Or is it too late? Well, it's not too late. The light from the Big Bang could have and would have made it all the way to us. In fact, it would be very bright. But the problem is that after the Big Bang, you had this time when the entire universe was opaque to light. And so we can't see it because then there's this intervening time where everywhere in the universe, there was essentially the entire universe was like the interior of a star incredibly hot and dense, compressed down. And then the entire universe was like the surface of a star still opaque that we couldn't see it. It wasn't until about 370,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe finally became transparent and light was able to escape. And that's the first light that we can see. But gravitational waves probably happened right with the Big Bang, and those could pass through the material that made up the universe at the time. And so there are plans to build much more sensitive gravitational wave observatories even more sensitive than Lisa, which is sort of one that's in the works for 2035. You know, one possibility it's called the Big Bang Observer, and it would be 12 Lisa satellites in this giant dodecahedron, which are sending their signals back and forth. And in theory, uh, a space telescope like that would be capable of detecting the ripples of space time that came from the Big Bang itself. And so it's a interesting question, because then you know, I don't know, it's, it's like if you can't see something, but maybe you can hear it, or you can feel the vibrations of something moving towards you that you can't see. So Right now we can't see right back to the Big Bang. But with gravitational waves, and maybe even neutrinos, uh, we might be able to eventually probe that time in the history of the universe. Bob Hoppeldorf, are there any binary supermassive black holes? Yes, uh, astronomers have identified several examples of supermassive black holes that are orbiting around each other. Now just to sort of understand how this works, right, you have two galaxies that merge and both galaxies have a supermassive black hole that is at the heart of them. And then as the galaxies merge, they sort of tear each other apart and they merge into this larger galaxy. And the supermassive black holes that were at the you know, at the center of the different galaxies, they both sink down into the middle of the galaxy, and then they start to orbit around each other. And eventually, they merge. And you know, we see very, very massive supermassive black holes, and they must be made up of the mergers from smaller black holes. And so this is the process that must be happening. So about a week ago, when I'm recording this, we reported on Universe Today, the story about the discovery of a an object called AT 2021 HDR. And this was known to have like a flash of radiation every couple of weeks. And astronomers have realized what this actually is, is that this is two supermassive black holes that are orbiting around each other. And they only take 130 days to go into orbit around each other. And they estimate that it is sort of a combined mass between the two supermassive black holes of 40 million times the mass of the sun. So when you think about the Milky Way's supermassive black hole, um, three and a half million times the mass of the sun. So this is a lot of mass. And yet they are orbiting each other very closely. And it's estimated that they're probably going to merge within the next uh, 70,000 years or so. And so this is an example, like wouldn't it be great if we could just stick around and watch that merger happen as those black holes come together and turn into this future 40 million solar mass black hole, and then maybe they'll find another one and merge with that. And that's how you get black holes with billions of times the mass of the sun, just merger by merger. Cat Lord 25 cats. Hi, what would pepperoni pizza taste like if it was cooked on the sun? Let's say you want to cook your pizza at 500 Fahrenheit, which is 260 degrees Celsius. And like that will give you like a really nice crispy crust, you'll get the melty cheese, you'll get the pepperoni will be kind of crispy, it's going to be really yummy. And so the sun is 5500 Celsius. So that is hotter. And so I don't know if you could get your pizza onto the surface of the sun quickly enough and remove it again, that it would cook, it would definitely be burnt. So what is like burnt pizza? Like I'm sure you've had burnt pizza, it's not great. But as you get farther and farther away from the sun, then the temperature is going to drop and there's going to be this sweet spot, it's going to be this perfect distance from the sun that matches the temperature of your oven. And it's not at the earth. 
Uh, so it's going to be somewhere in between the Earth and the Sun, maybe like around Venus or something. I haven't done the math exactly, but there'll be this place where you could take your pizza, put it in a glass box, put it in an oven, float your oven in space, and and it would cook and it would be perfect. So you just need to find that perfect spot in the solar system to cook your space pizza. Kip Nielsen, isn't the corona of the sun much hotter than the surface? Absolutely. So the corona is the atmosphere of the sun. And when you see, say, a total solar eclipse, and the disk of the sun is blocked by the moon, then what you get is you can see the corona, these amazing wisps of gas that are going out into space, and it's like bigger than uh, sort of the size of the moon. It's incredible. And the temperature is ludicrously high, like it is into the millions of degrees. When the surface of the sun is only 5800 Kelvin, the corona can be millions. And this was a huge mystery in astronomy, like why is the corona so hot compared to the sun. And for the longest time, we didn't know and nobody really had a good concrete reason to explain this. And you know, we know that there are coronal mass ejections, there are flares that happen on the surface of the sun, and they must contribute in some way to this material and the magnetic fields that are snapping and popping around the surface of the sun. But it wasn't until probably the last five years or so, that astronomers finally figured out what it was. And it was predicted a long time ago that there would probably be the presence of what are called nano flares, that there would be these tiny versions of flares on the surface of the sun, and that all of them would contribute to heating up this atmosphere around the sun. So you wouldn't get one single event, you just have this combined heating from all of these little flares. And thanks to the Parker Solar Probe, thanks to Solar Orbiter, thanks to other Earth based observatories, they're actually able to confirm that. Now, I'm not sure how well it would cook pizza though. So I'll have to look into that. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who uh, asked the questions in the YouTube comments, everyone who joined us for the live stream. There's going to be the upcoming date and time for the next show somewhere here on my channel. They change now. So I'm not sure whether which which time stream is going to be the next one. Now I'm going to chat about our presence on blue sky. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, SpiderSwap.io, and Stephen Filer Munley, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I finally got around to setting up our presence on Blue Sky. And this is, of course, the new social networking application like threads like Twitter like Facebook. And so uh, we're on blue sky, I was able to sign up with our own domain name. And so now the main universe today feed is just universe today.com on blue sky. And then I'm F Kane dot universe today dot com on blue sky. And so that's their version of being verified. So you know, it's actually me and it's actually universe today. And so I'll be posting on the universe today feed just it's automated. It's a robot beep boop. It's just going to be publishing the stories that we're posting on universe today. And then for my own custom feed, I'm just sharing a bunch of stories that I'm working on interesting observations, astrophotos that I've been taking and participating in the conversation. So if you want to connect with me in another way, uh, you can find me over on blue sky as well. In addition to all of the other social media applications. All right, we'll see you next week.